Okay, let's, uh, um, the Cavell reading's kind of hard. You guys notice that? Yeah, I mean, that's like, that's like real, that's like real philosophy. Sorry about that. <laughs> but, um, well, his, his, uh, uh, well, we read him, what did we read him on? Othello, that wasn't, that wasn't that hard. This was harder, huh? So, well, fortunately, you all have your, uh, uh Cartesian meditations and, uh, and I'm sure you've all read Kant's Critique of Pure Reason in the last six months because, I mean, of course, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can just tell. You just have an air of, of uh, uh, Kantianness about you. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so do, we have any, do we have any questions? I'm worried about this quiz. I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah. I don't know. I, I wrote that honestly because I didn't know the answer. Do you have it? <laughs> um, it basically just said like no one can know. There's like no way to tell. Does that mean it's like mm. subjected to different people or like? Yeah. What does it mean? In the context of what he was talking about with regards to the story, it seemed like uh, Leontes took it to mean something so meaningful that yes, it would have to count because of the way he reacted to it. Yeah. But he didn't okay. really say. Hopefully we'll look at that passage because that's a that's, that's another one of those bizarre Leontian passages. Yeah. Uh, number ten. Why do we always tell less and more than we know? Yeah. Again, I was trying to. Uh, I just. I mean, I, I wanted to read it, but I didn't want to read it that closely. <laughs> so I just wrote the question down. And I was hoping that somebody would answer it. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was because we have a wish for everything and nothing at the same time. I don't know. That sounds deep. I like that. <laughs> I'm going with that. <laughs> Because like we want like everything, because everything, everything, that's, that's another thing, right? Is everything is, so nothing is actually everything because it's plentitude because, I don't know, answer your, your question. Yeah. Question, mm -hmm. 22, what chain of equations does taking jealousy as derivative of the sense of revenge upon life solve? That's awesome. <laughs> what chain of equations does taking jealousy as derivative of the sense of revenge upon life solve? One where fathers and sons are lovers and wives and mothers are actually. Yeah, so I've got the, taking the jealousy as derivative of the sense of revenge upon life, upon its issuing, so issuing is, is uh, uh, primarily in this sense, issuing is what? Siring. Yeah, birthing, yeah. Uh, or separating, and then separating is important because, because uh, uh, nothing is actually everything but not separated, right? Plenitude, <laughs> right? Okay, and uh, or replication. <clears throat> I am taking it as, so to speak, that so to speak there is important. The solution of a problem in computation or economy, one that at a stroke solves the chain of equations in which sons and brothers are lovers, and lovers are fathers and sons, and wives and mothers become one another. So what's the story? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right. So we've got the so jealousy is derivative of the sense of revenge upon life. All right. So uh, so there's a sense of revenge upon life because you're mad at life or something, and jealousy is derivative of that general just f the world attitude. Okay, I get it. All right. And uh, upon its issuing, what's the its the jealousy? Yeah. Okay. Or separating or replication. <coughs> It's fun. <laughs> what was the question again? <laughs> well, the question just asks, what chain of equations does it solve? And the chain of equations is just the one that, uh, uh, as you pointed out, right? Yeah, it's just uh, it's a simple, simple thing. It's the chain of equations in which sons and brothers are lovers, and lovers are fathers, and sons and wives and mothers become one another. Ooh, that's very musical. So that would be the answer. <laughs> Um, <laughs> sons and brothers are lovers. That's hot. Lovers are fathers and sons. So, hold on. Oh, no. I have no markers. Are there some back there? Oh, cursed, cursed, cursed. All right. 
Let's go have ice cream instead. <laughs> okay, uh, actually, you know what? I think I've got one in the bag. <laughs> well, that goes without saying. <laughs> like I would come to class without ice cream. I'm no fool. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I have one if you need one. All right, got it. All right, so. So we've got sons. Brothers equals lovers. <clears throat> I don't think equation is the right word for this. Lovers are fathers, sons. <laughs> and then and, so that would be plus, right? <laughs> Wives, mothers. So that would be the uh, that would be the equation. <laughs> so if it's on the quiz, that's the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. Um, this actually isn't as complicated as it looks. Why does Hermione say she preserved herself? Where is that? Uh, Nineteen. Why does Hermione say she preserved herself? All right. For what reason? So she and she speaks. Does she, does she, uh, um, does she, uh, is her first words to Leonti saying, I saved my chaste flower for you? Yeah, yeah it's Perdita. And the reason she gives for preserving herself, this is actually dwelt on in some detail. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> Ooh. She wanted to see her. She wanted to see her issue and try to. That's why she preserved herself. <sighs> that was the easy question too. <laughs> yeah, she wanted to see her kid. That's why she preserved herself. But how did she know? You ever get the sense that maybe Paulina engineered this whole thing? Possibly Ca Camilla. She's like, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Well, because Paulina, so she, well, she got rid of her husband. She was able to torture the king for 16 years. That'd be fun. I would take that job. Just imagine, like, it's like your job is like whoever's president, you just torture them. <laughs> be great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, number 13, what is the matter for story and what is the matter for drama? Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a good one. Anyone have an answer for that? So that the matter for drama was that you had a wife that you thought was lost, but really wasn't. And the matter of story was the story of her daughter who was found lost. Lost and found, sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me see if there's anything else I need out of that. I thought they would have to be empirically lost, whatever that means. Okay, yeah, so there's, so I think that's kind of, so uh, he says, this is confined as a matter of this drama's competition with narrative romance. By making the finding of a child who has been empirically lost, in fact, in fact is italicized, rejected and abandoned, a matter swiftly dealt with by simple narration. So we're dealing with an empirically lost and in fact rejected and abandoned matter is, is, the, is for narration. So in fact, empirically. The matter for drama, by contrast, is to investigate the finding of a wife not in fact, empirically lost, but let me say, transcendentally lost. <laughs> We're actually going to learn about that today. Lost just because one is blind to her, as if it were conceptually unprepared for her because that one is blind to himself, lost to himself. That's, that's so clear. <laughs> okay, so I think the, the, the mythical gist here is that... Uh, um, that narrative can deal with empirical facts and like objective reality. All right, so this is good. You guys know the difference between objective and subjective, right? Yeah. So narrative deals with objective and drawn. So, so objectively lost is the matter for, for a, a narrative and subjectively lost is the, uh, the matter for drama.
So just not really lost, but as if. So like the, uh, yeah, OK. See, I, uh, I'll, I'll write Professor Cavell and tell him to clear this crap up. It's an easy thing to do. Yeah. Dovetailing excellently with the question we just, yes, sir. I was going to say the competition of poetic theater with non theatrical romance. Yeah, so what we just <laughs> talked about romance versus drama. Yeah. Um, uh, Glistening Cipher is an example of what breeding? Nothing. Yeah. Out yeah, nothing breeding out of control. I like that. Yes, sir. Can Hermione be understood as Leon Caesar's Yeah, that's weird. Well, I said something like, essentially, she's resurrected at the end, and she's only able to be resurrected because of his, his bullshit that caused her to be lost in the first place. Right. Okay, that works, yeah. And is she respected daughter? And, like, I have issues with her. So um, when she's come to life because of him, she's like, Okay, but how did, all right, so, uh, so there's that, and then, and then the, the Cavell says, and this ties into uh, the, um, the thing that I said about how nothing is actually everything undifferentiated. So, um, so uh, kind of the, one of the key features of Cavell's argument is he says that, that nothing is actually everything from Leontes' perspective, because when he's, saying, when he's saying blah, 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 blah is nothing, he's really saying that it's all, it's all in me. There's no... There's no separation between me and the world. You know, I'm controlling everything with my mind. There's no, so it's one of the one of the seven laws of magical thinking is not seeing a boundary between your mind and reality. So, um, so when he's having his crisis, he doesn't he doesn't recognize that, that uh, there's an external reality that you know the trees falling in the forest. If he's not seeing it, that's not true for him. But when Hermione when, when Hermione uh, comes alive. He recognizes that um, the the, uh, the plenitude, the nothing, is split, and so and, and then so it says right here. Let us emphasize that this ceremony of union takes the form of a ceremony of separation, thus declaring that the question of two be becoming one is just half the problem. The other half is how one becomes two. So uh, so the plenitude of Leontes' psychosis splits off, and one becomes two, and that's what the marriage ceremony does. And so she becomes separate from him and, and in effect gains her own reality, in effect is getting birth, and then she is therefore Leontes' issue. You guys should have all got stoned for this class. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, man. Dude, like everything is nothing, man. Um, what institution does he seem to be against? It's either religion or marriage. marriage. Yes, marriage. I saw the word marriage in there somewhere, so I could. Um, let's see. Well, marriage is, marriage is, but, but, so uh, drama is replacing a major institution. So, would, do you think the drama is replacing marriage? I mean, it's lampooning marriage. It's the religion. Hmm? It's the religion. Yeah, that's what, that's what Cavell says. I myself don't, don't buy it for a minute, but that's what Cavell says. That's just another kind of drama. Yeah. What is the main difference for Cavell between Leontes and Descartes' interrogation of reality by doubts? Yeah, but but they're both they, they both hold on to doubts and then uh, and and. Isn't um, like Leontes like a madman and the other guy found reason? Yeah, Descartes doesn't quite go mad. Okay, so that's good. Everybody get that? Descartes doesn't go mad. All right, so uh, Descartes goes on the verge of madness because of his doubt, but, uh, but pulls it back because he, he reaches outside of the system and grounds, grounds it on, on God. But Leontes doesn't do that, so he goes mad. So Descartes, not mad for most people. Some people think he's mad. Leontes, mad. Everybody remember that. Remember that. There may, it might be on a quiz. Um, how is wanting nothing the same as wanting no separation? Excellent question. 
Okay, so this is from the, uh, uh, it's on 207, if anyone has their text. <laughs> I said that Leontes loses the ability to count, to tell, to recount his experiences, and now I am taking that at his point, his strategy, to turn this punishment into his victory. Before he is recovered, he wants not to count, not to own. What is happening to him as <laughs> his wants for there to be no counting, which is to say nothing. Why? This takes us to that other region of parting of that departure, separating, dividing, branching, grafting, <coughs> flowering, shearing, issuing, delivering, breeding. Without partings in this region, there is nothing. If nothing comes from nothing, and if something comes only from the seeds of this earth, Leontes is quite logical in wanting there to be nothing, to want there to be no separation. So the answer is, <laughs> so, <laughs> nothing is a stable static state, and that something, the getting something, speaks of development and growth. So in something you have, by necessity, a separation that comes from development. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Why, uh, uh, that doesn't help. <laughs> can't, can't you just say you need separation to start having something? Yes. Because otherwise, if there's if nothing's separated, what's the difference between something and nothing? nothing. And there's no difference, right? Because if you had if you had something and nothing, then you have separation and therefore you have something and you can't say everything's nothing. Yes. See this actually isn't this this is this is but sometimes one suspects that the whole business of philosophy is taking very easy, intuitive things and making them very complicated. <laughs> and I say that as, a, as someone who loves philosophy. Yeah. What besides succession is recognizing slash legitimizing one's child essential to question 14? Yeah. Individual sanity? Yes. Individual sanity. Number 14. So what's the difference between a regular Oedipal situation, the tragic, and, a, and the Oedipal situation in romance? The father wants to replace the son, and then the, or the runner is the son wants to replace the father. Backwards. <laughs> so wait, what is it? So in tragedy, there's a, there's a father and a son. So the tragic, the tragic Oedipal, which is the Oedipal triangle we all learned, is a, a, who wants to replace who between the father and the son? And then, so in the romance, Oedipal, right. Well, I mean, it's, it's well, as, as, as in romance, as in the genre of romance. So we're not talking like the ro romantic movement or romantic poets or romantic love, just the, you know, prose romances. Yeah? How does speaking relate to I love how we're all devolving into into a philosophical babble. <laughs> Not really, it's great. And this is I'm really happy right now. I felt completely the opposite as I did when we were talking about cuckold porn. <laughs> so to speak is to say what counts on two oh five. That would work too. So you'll get extra points for, for uh, putting in like just when you're writing, if you put in so to speak or whatever, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anything else? I don't think I'm going to remember any of this. <laughs> well, you, 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 you may or may not. <laughs> the good news is if we bomb this quiz, I won't put many of the questions on the uh, final. <laughs> All right, let's pass them up. So that was purposefully designed so you wouldn't be nostalgic and miss the quizzes. <laughs> Yeah.
my little brother's argument against the humane treatment of farm animals. But, you know, like if you're a cow and you're eating organic grain and you get the free range and everything, and then they come and kill you, it's a tragedy. But if, you're, if your life's all miserable and then they come and kill you, it's sweet, sweet release. So it's actually unethical to treat animals that you're going to kill. Well, I don't know point. Yeah, right. He's not as clever as he thinks he is. What's that? Yeah. Now, that, uh, the, the bear thing, did anyone get an answer to the bear question? The bear was lost. Yeah. 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 I haven't heard it right yet. Yeah. Yeah. I just said in general that bear is an agent of nature and that humans are subject to nature, which was kind of Interesting. what he was trying to say. Yeah, I believe he said that the, uh, the difference between uh, humans and the bear was that the bear only ate when he was hungry and, uh, and bears have, or humans have insatiable, insatiable hungers that will still eat when we're hungry. Yeah. I, I said that a little bit broader that the bear responded to instinctual motives and that the human might have some more sinister you know, uh, calculated instinctual motives. <laughs> more calculated uh, yeah. I, mean, I don't know, it doesn't sound like anybody or one person got it right, so I might be generous on it. You never know. <laughs> probably not. I'll probably be I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I want that the uh, the satiability that uh, that the bears stop eating when they're full. Okay, so let's uh, um, let's try and try and uh, by the end of class today finish Monday's lecture, last Monday's lecture. <laughs> okay, so uh, w where we were was uh, uh, I'm getting more and more absent-minded by the day. I think it's like twelve or something. Page twelve or something. <laughs> Okay, yeah, page 10. Not, not quite, I was uh, getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Still in Act 1, Scene 2, <laughs> where we're, uh, we're all going to die. So uh, to get us up to speed, we're, uh, uh, we're looking at this passage from, uh, I guess, 128 to uh, 146, page 10 and 11. And where we were at was we were looking at the... Uh, is we're, we're having Leontes sort of uh, walk, intellectually walking us through his break with reality. So he starts off with uh, um, getting lost in a cow metaphor. And then, uh, so he says, you don't resemble, you don't resemble a full grown cow, therefore I can't be sure that you're my son. And, uh, um, and then it's like, well, but, but they say that we resemble each other, so then he moves his, he moves his uh, um, relationship with knowledge to uh, external validation. But what was the problem with they? Women will say anything. Yeah, women will say anything. And they were as false as or dyed blacks, which we corrected Signet and uh, um, decided that uh, it wasn't that they were dyed too many times, but that they were, they were dyed over to conceal. And then uh, um, wind and waters were false because they're contingent and unpredictable, as in, as in uh, bless you. And... Uh, uh, and then false as dice are, are to be wished by one that fixes them. And that makes true and false a completely subjective thing. Because uh, um, false, he, he's, what he's defining as false is only false to him. It would be true to the uh, person that he's playing dice against. Okay. So, and then, and then, uh, uh, and then we were also talking about how it begins as a, as a question, but ends up. So the question is, were they as false as X, Y, Z ends up as uh, as now, this isn't to, to, to uh, Blake's, Blake's offhand comment about it is actually the big conclusion that we're drawing to. We're not quite there yet. So there's an implied pseudo-proverb. As women are as deceitful, as flawed, closed, eyed black, as unreliable as the winds and waters, and as unchaste as the guy who wants to commit adultery with them wants them to be. Yeah. Okay. You know, worldwide... It says that in here. Oh, never mind. <laughs> just, I'm just a veritable cornucopia of useless trivia. <coughs> and then the philosophical pseudo-axiom, the uh, were it true to say this boy were like me is dependent on the were they false. The truth of resemblance is based on their falseness, and their falseness being false <laughs> negates the truth of the resemblance they claim. I'm sounding like Cavell. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> 
I can unpack that. Is it clear enough? Okay, so, uh, no, it's not worth it. I won't put it on the test. Yeah, here we go. Basically, just you can't determine a woman's honesty by women's testimony. Good job. Sometimes I anticipate myself surprisingly well. Uh oh. Uh, now things get complicated. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Anyone want to uh, want to read it? Yeah, it's it's on there. Yeah, ten. <coughs> Middle um, of one thirty-five. Yeah. Thank you. Now, uh, in, in comparing, you'll, as, I, as I note at the bottom, you'll uh, uh, notice that the, the signet just slaughters the uh, punctuation that was in the folio. This is the, uh, the way that it was, the way that it was, uh, um, the way that the god of the folio intended. And uh, there's one part in particular we'll see that it's, uh, it's caused um, years and years and years of uh, misinterpretation of this passage. Okay, um, so we'll break it down. First part, come, Sir Page, look on me with your welkin eye, sweet villain, most dearest, my call-up, can thy damn, may it be affection. <coughs> so who's he talking to here? Besides himself, who he's really talking to? Really? Yeah, his son, Sir Page, welkin eye. Um, <coughs> so I just, uh, come, my boy, look me in the eye. Can your mom, may it be affection? So this is the, um, it's like the, the Larry David from Curb Your Enthusiasm. Because uh, supposedly you can't look someone in the eye when you're lying. I myself can lie like there's no tomorrow and look somebody in the eye. In fact, it's easier for me to lie and look someone in the eye than tell the truth. Does anyone else have this experience? <laughs> because you've got to be more firm with a lie. You've got to stick to it. Just like my mama taught me. <laughs> it doesn't matter how stupid your lie is, boy, stick with it to the end. <laughs> So uh, here we have this affection problem again. So what does affection mean here? There's a loaded question. So it could mean uh, lovey, warm fuzziness. Passion. OED 2A. False pretenses as an affectation. Uh, disease or abnormality. Something that affects something else. Emotional product of external influence. Emotion, passion versus reason. Product of imagination as in a mental state. The note says passion. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we have a, a segment votes for passion. Um, let's see what let's see what I do with it. <laughs> Nothing. Great. <laughs> Sometimes I let myself down. So uh, lovey, warm, fuzziness. So uh, can thy damn may it be affection? So uh, can your mom look me in the eye? May it be affection? Yeah, it could be. Because he's asking a question, may it be? Does she have affection for me? Sure. False pretenses, may it be affectation? If she looks me in the eye, doing the, 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 the Daniel look in the eye. Mom, I promise I did not eat those cookies. <laughs> it was, but you're the only one in the house. Um, <laughs> all I can tell you is I didn't eat them. All right, I'm going with, I'm going with the, uh, the first two. Disease or abnormality? Yeah, that works too. I mean, could, could, could I be losing my mind? Do I have a mental disease? Um, something that affects something else? Well, well obviously, because <laughs> I mean, there's a broad definition for you. <laughs> um, 
Emotional product of external influence? What's not? Uh, emotion, passion versus reason? Con contrary to the uh, uh, signet, I think that uh, that's the only one that I think is completely wrong. Which one? The one that the signet says. <laughs> Product of imagination. Yeah, meant, but I mean, again. All right. So this is this is what Signet gives us, right? And uh, this is the basis of uh, most readings of the passage. Affection. Thy intention stabs the center. Thou doest make possible things not so held. Communicatest with dreams. How can this be? With what's unreal, thou coactive art, and fellowest nothing. So that's perfectly clear, right? So who's the... <laughs> So, um, so it's a, a, a kind of a, a, a ode to affection as a rational passion, a la the signet. This makes the thy refer to the uh, uh, affection, which is fine if you punctuate it like signet does. So, um, so it's, just, it's, it's talking to affection, right? So it's a affection. You stab at the center. So stabbing at the center would be... Think uh, Yeats, the center cannot hold the stability of the world that holds everything together, the unity of perceived reality. Thou makest possible things not so held. What does that mean? Things thought not possible. Hmm? Things thought not possible. Yeah. Communicate us with dreams. Communicates with dreams. Talk to dreams. Okay. Oh, affection. You disrupt the ground of reality and make us believe stuff that isn't real. See signet footnote. <laughs> yeah, that's what it says. <laughs> Except for mine's a little bit clearer. Okay, that's, that's pretty clear, right? Everyone get that? All right. Uh, as with most great ideas, the only problem with this one is that it's wrong. <laughs> affection is the last word of the question about Hermione, as we saw. So, uh, and then so, so you know, the, the, the standard... And this actually wasn't Signet's idea. A lot of editions have been doing this because it makes the, makes the reading a lot, a lot easier. Um, so the thy refers to the subject of the preceding sentence, which is not affection, but Hermione. So it's uh, um, Hermione's intention stabs the center. Thou does so everything else. So Hermione's the thing, not affection. So it's not, it's not an ode to madness. Uh, but Hermione's unknowable intention whether she is affecting love, orgasm, paternity of children is the thing that's making him lose his, uh, lose his consciousness. And this actually makes more sense, right? This is more Othello-esque. And I, it's, it seems very uncharacteristic for Leontes to be waxing poetical about an abstraction. That's not really his thing. He only waxes poetical about his personal problems. So the uh, un undeterminable possibilities of her intention, which is his, her desire, is what for Leontes creates the alliance with fantasy, communicate us with dreams, art, and the break with reality, fellow us nothing. So uh, Hermione's intention has knocked out any possibility of uh, empirical knowledge and uh, um, lined Leontes up with fantasy. And then, uh, um, and then he contemplates how that break can, can so his, how his psychosis how, how his dream reality can affect reality. That's when he says co-join with something, right? So tis, then tis very credent thou mayest co-join with something. So after he says that there's no reality, he says then, then, uh, then that means that, that it can co-join with something which is not nothing. And so the not reality actually affects reality. This is deep philosophical stuff, man. Hope I go somewhere with this. <laughs> It can affect reality in any way, and it's not a bound to the authoritative charge or direction to act in a prescribed manner. So that's the uh, um, beyond commission, right? So, so uh, once, once broken from reality, Hermione's mysterious intention affects reality, and it affects in reality that doesn't, does not need to follow the laws of uh, physics, um, humanity, God, anything, because it's just totally free-floating and just, you know, angry and contingent and uh, um, chance-ish, right? So uh, this discovery of essential contingency at the heart of things disquieting, it inflicts his brain, hardens his brows, not just the cuckold sense, but also makes his countenance stern and happy. 
Remember I was saying that they actually over, over-glossed cuckold jokes in Shakespeare? And um, so what's, what's happening is, is he's got a stable vision of reality that's undermined by the mystery of Hermione's intention. And it causes him a crisis, right? So, uh, uh, you know, in the sense, now he doesn't know if, if, if his colostomy is reversible or not. And so, <laughs> right? So this is, this is uh, and, and, and we know, what's at the heart of comedy? Tragedy. Chance. I was going for chance, but tragedy works too. So, uh, so this contingency is at the heart of comedy. So what Leontes is really having here is a comic crisis. He's not dealing with his being in a com- comedy very well. As I put here in a, in a briefer, more concise. I'm, I'm banning myself from PowerPoints. You guys are witnessing the last Crumbo PowerPoint. <laughs> he has discovered the essence of comedy and reality. Comedy equals dependence on chance, and it's unbearable. As with Othello, he decides to fight off the encounter with comic contingency by imposing tragic certainty. So that's the only way you can be sure if your wife is a whore. Yeah, and you have to you have to watch her getting topped, <laughs> as uh, as Iago puts it. Okay, no more uh, no more of that nonsense. Okay, so we've got this uh, um, this 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 mission of uh, uh, stop that comedy or prove my love a whore. That uh, uh, that Leontes is so uh, so obsessed with. So um, Leontes doesn't have any on the trade his fantasy, or does he? I don't know. So he has to cuckold himself to the grounds for tragic certainty. So let's look at 173. I'm on page 12. And uh, 174, starting with Hermione, can I get a Leontes? Actually, you know what, let's, nah, let, yeah, let's just go one step at a time. No, no. Thou, thou lovest us, show in our brother's welcome. Let what is dear in Sicily be cheap, next to thyself and my young rover. He's a parent to my heart. Okay, so um, so what's he what's what's he saying here? What is uh what does he mean by what is dear in Sicily? Let it be cheap. <coughs> what's dear in Sicily? What does dear mean? Uh, think think uh think economics, the basic law of of uh, of being a merchant. Uh, uh, buy cheap, sell dear. Yeah, highly valued, expensive. So what's so what's valued highly in Sicily? Let it be cheap. Yeah. So, but what else? What what would be really really highly valued valued in Sicily? Yeah. Yeah, Hermione. Because it's the queen. Supposedly. Oh right. Yeah, so, so he's a, okay, there you go. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so uh, so what's he, uh, what's he suggesting to Hermione do? And then he says, to your own bench, so go to the garden, let what's, let, let what's dear in Sicily be cheap. Go to the garden and do whatever you want. Nobody's going to bug you. That's what he says, right? To your own bents dispose you, you'll be found, be you beneath the sky. And then aside, I am angling now, though you perceive me not how I give line. Go to, go to. How she holds up the nap to bill the bill to him and arms her with, with the boldness of a wife to her allowing husband. What's the boldness of a wife to her allowing husband? Putting up. Yeah, what would it, what's an allowing husband? What would an allowing husband be? Not just. So with the boldness, the boldness of a wife to her allowing husband. Okay, since I don't want to dwell on this forever, since we've got a big philosophical thing to discuss that I don't want to overlap into the next one, I'm going to tell you. This is this is just line for line and completely explicit cuckold fantasy scenario. I am angling now, go off to the garden. I'll perceive you whether I'm there or not. You know, so don't worry, you know, like 
because he controls the world with his mind. You know, <laughs> let, let your dear expensive thing, your chastity, be cheap. And, uh, and, and, and then aside, he's like, oh, there he goes. Just like a, uh, uh, just, just with the boldness of a wife to her allowing husband, and allowing husband is a wife that allows, or a husband that allows his wife fun, right? So allowing husband is a voluntary cuckold, or the schmo in the uh, in the porn scenario. Got it? So if that's if that's on the uh, if that's on the uh, the final, that's what that's about. All right. Uh, good. So gives her the okay. Points of attention, and then and then awkwardly tells his son, "Go play, boy, play. Thy mother plays, and I play too. But so disgraced apart, whose issue will hiss me to the grave. Contempt and clamor will be my knell. Go play, boy, play. There have been uh, much to see. Cuckolds here now. So he goes into this whole uh, this whole thing. It's awkward to bring a son into this like that. But um, <laughs> but fortunately, so so he's so he's making himself the orchestrator." Of his of his own cuckold fantasy, okay, and then uh, um, and then from 189 on, there have been or I am much deceived cuckolds here now, and many a man there is, even at this present now while I speak this, holds his wife by the arm that little thinks she has been sluiced in the absence. <laughs> That's great in his absence. <laughs> I I love the, uh, the the dysphemisms for sex that Leontes has, <laughs> and his pond fished by his next neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sir. <laughs> oh, he's he's fishing the next man's pond. <laughs> sir, smile, his neighbor. Nay, there's comfort in it. Huh? So he's he's uh, picturing his pond getting fixed by his fished by his neighbor, or that uh, um, or his wife's getting sluiced. <laughs> but there's comfort in it. So while whilst other men have gates, and those gates opened as mine against their will. So there's the, uh, whoa, huh. I think I broke my throat. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I did. This is what happens. It's like when you go get an oil changed Jiffy Lube and then your, your starter goes out. All right. Um, Interesting. At least it'll be caught on YouTube when I die. So, uh, uh, so the comfort is that he is aware of the fishing of his pond. So there's comfort in that. So by orchestrating his own cuckold fantasy, he somehow gets comfort, I guess. Because why? Well, because he's imposing tragic certainty on it. And yeah. Yes. Yes. The the colostomy principle explains 95% of human behavior. Yeah, yeah. That the only caveat to that would be that um, right now he's sort of talking himself into. He still hasn't. He still right now it's still just a possibility that he will be cuckolded. He hasn't. He hasn't put it all together yet. But other than that, you're completely right. And you may be completely all the way right. Maybe he just hasn't said it. But yeah, it's so. So he's just gaining control over the uh, uh, of the uh, of the contingent situation. Yeah. If he doesn't think he's been cuckolded yet, then why doesn't he think that? She's his daughter. Well, the, has, has, has that come to terms yet? Has that occurred to him yet? Yeah. We're still only on page 13. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah, so, um, should all despair that have revolted wives, the tenth of mankind would hang themselves. And this is actually right on the money. So there's a... Um, uh, in, in worldwide cross-cultural surveys, I'm sure I've said this before, but uh, exactly 90% of children are the uh, parents or the, are the children of the guy that they think is their dad and that their dad thinks. So uh, you can look at this two-way. All right, women are 90% faithful. Or, you know, the, the, class, the glass can also be half full. So that means, like, uh, so there's 35 of you here.
I, there's no way to tell by looking. <laughs> so, uh, so this is the, uh, um, so his desire graph would be desire one, happiness, desire two, certainty, his relationship with knowledge is he's making it up as he goes along. The problem is same as always, conflicting desires, right? And the solution, well, you'll recall that this is exactly Othello's desire, desire chart. So um, solution would just be sort of like tragedy or whatever, right? So, uh, wow, still, still page 13. So then he gets his confirmation from Camillo. So he's re replaying the thing, except for now he's getting his confirmation by a not woman. So he can take it seriously, even though, uh, um, even the, uh, though uh, Camillo is... Um, Let's read just a little bit. Can I get a uh, um, uh, Leontes and a Camillo? Somebody that hasn't gone. You've already gone. Let's do these two. <laughs> All right, start with uh, um, um, uh, why that's some comfort. That's two, oh, okay. eight or nine. Why that's some comfort. What Camilla there? Hi, my good lord. Go play Mamilius. Thou, thou art an old man. This, Camilla, this great sir, will you yet stay longer? You had much ado to make his anchor hold. When you cast out, it will still come home. <laughs> it's noted. <laughs> he would not stay in your petitions, made his business more material. This, receive it. Okay, actually, that's good. I just wanted to get the sense of it. Do you, does this recall a famous conversation from Othello at all? And how Iago was, was, was prompting? I like nothing. Yeah. So, uh, in effect, this does the same thing, right? He's, uh, um, he's, you had much to do to make his anchor hold. When <laughs> you cast out, it still came home. Did notice? He would not stay at your petition, made his business more material. So, it, so it's sort of a, maybe an involuntary Iago. But it's interesting to think that maybe Camillo is orchestrating this whole thing and actually is a is an Iago-ish figure because it actually kind of makes sense because he does manipulate situations to his own advantage with absolutely no, you know, conscious of. I want somebody to do Camillo's a psychopath for their uh, exam question. <laughs> I think it'll work, and then you know we find out he has a woman's longing for Sicily for Sicily later, so maybe he's got like some sort of like. Uh, um, uh, attachment, woman-like attachment to Leontes and is trying to get rid of the uh, competition. Intriguing. I think somebody should go there. I'm not going, I'm not going to. Uh, but the, the point is, again, as with we saw with, uh, um, with Hermione and, 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 and Polly's um, discussion, that you can interpret Camillo's talk as innocent bander. You can interpret it in the way that Leontes does. And so Leontes interprets it as confirmation that, um, that, uh, that, that the wife's cheating on him, right? So um, language is ambiguous, interpretable, unstable, blah, blah, blah. So what about ocular or sensory proof? Let's look at 267 on the next. Um, ha. Not you seen Camillo, but that's passed out. You have, or your eyeglasses, or your eyeglasses thicker than a cuckold torn, or heard, for to a vision so apparent, rumor cannot be mute or thought. For cog cogitation resides not in the man that does not think. My wife is slippery. So, um, so he's bringing out uh, vision as confirmation. So. Uh, but what's the problem with his appeal to vision? Does he actually ask if anybody saw anything? Let's look at the text. He sends them into the garden by themselves. What's that? He sends them into the garden by themselves. Yeah. Yeah, so nobody sees. So, so he, he calls on, uh, have you not seen Camillo? But that's passed out. You have. Doesn't even ask if he actually saw anything. Because has Camillo seen anything? No. Has anybody? No. So he's like, so he's ostensibly appealing to empirical evidence. My throat is seriously broken. Whoa. <laughs> um, but he's not. He just says, did you not see? Oh, but of course you have, or your eyeglasses are too thick. 
have you heard? And then, I, and then, well, rumor, rumor would say, you know, so he appeals to rumor for his uh, um, auditory proof. Is rumor good auditory proof in your guys' Yeah, I agree it is. And then thought, but his, agreed, his, his conditions for thought is that, uh, um, that you're not thinking if you don't think that his wife is slippery. So that's good, right? So uh, anyway, the point is that his empirical evidence is not so good. Uh, disagreeing with my conclusion equals you're not thinking. And then we get to the uh, is whispering nothing passage. Um, is whispering nothing. Is leaning cheek to cheek. Is meeting noses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, kissing with inside lip, stopping the career of laughter with a sigh, a note infallible of breaking honesty, horsing foot on foot, skulking in corners, wishing clocks more swift, hours, minutes, noon, midnight, and all eyes blind with the pin in the web, but theirs, theirs only. That would be, that would unseen be wicked. Is this nothing? Why then the world and all that's in it is nothing. The covering sky is nothing. Bohemia, nothing. My wife is nothing. No, nothing. Have these nothings. If this be nothing. Well, he kind of eclipses uh, Cavell there, right? So there's a catalog of all these infil infallible signs of infatuation. So, um, right, so he just kind of goes off a checklist is, is you know, um, well, were they nudging noses? Were they being footsie? Then, uh, um, and then, but, but, but uh, uh, what does he mean by nothing? Yeah, something. So uh, is whispering nothing? Uh, well, it's not 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 a uh, is is proof, right? Is whispering not proof? Is leaning cheek to cheek? Is meeting noses? Kissing with the inside lip? Not proof of something, right? Proof of what? Who is he talking about? Did he see any of this? No, this is all his fantasy. Crap, he is imagining. So his speech pretty much amounts to, if my fantasy is not substantial proof that nothing exists, right? This is good philosophy. So uh, not only new age, I mean, sorry, new age. <laughs> I like to, <laughs> we pronounce it like sewage. <laughs> uh, manifesting power of visualization, but one step further. Imagination grounds external reality. And as, as Cavell notes, this is actually very Cartesian. So... Um, Anyone know what uh, uh, Descartes' cogito ergo sum means? I think therefore I am. Yeah, I think therefore I am. So uh, that means that uh, the only certainty without God is that I'm thinking. So my thinking is the grounding of reality. And then you have to, he has to bring God from outside the system to prove that he's not being deceived. But Leontes, um, who does not seem to be any kind of concern with a God to uh, uh, reinforce his, his certainty. So... Um, let me show you this, because this actually either speaks really poorly for contemporary philosophy or really well for uh, New Age people. So this is a, a quick lesson in Kant. Really, really, really quick lesson in Kant. <laughs> so we have, what's this? Something. Something. Okay, you can't tell. Uh, this is the... Uh, <laughs> It's unknowable. The thing in itself, or he calls it the, uh, the noumena. And then you've got this, this, this uh, introversible gap. And then you've got uh, perception. And so perception kind of works as, as casting, in, casting a net, as my philosophy teacher used to say, in, in the unknowable noumena of, of what's really out there. And then only getting back what the senses can perceive, right? So, uh, so this is going and filtered into perception, and perception gets a tree out of it, right? And then for reasons that I'm not going to get into here, there's a circle. But it's just I can't draw the chart without the circle. So this is, this is a, a representation or representation, but since we're doing pseudo-philosophy, we'll do pseudo-philosophy all the way. And then you get... The, the three Kantian categories for disseminating it. It's reason, uh, which is math, that sort of, you know, like good, good, uh, good hard, hard thought, understanding, uh, which is the, um, 
other stuff, and then aesthetics. <laughs> I don't want to talk too much about comp. So anyway, uh, but the point is that um, you don't really know what's out there, right? You only know what your senses can perceive, and then you've got these faculties that process it into a coherent reality, right? This seems about right, right? I mean, do you, do you guys think that you really see what's really out there all the time? Anyone want to say, yes, I do? Okay, good. There's nothing worse than naive realists. But, um, <laughs> so the, but the problem is, you know, of course, you know, so if, uh, uh, if we can't see what's really out there, how do we know that it's right? So um, how do we know that it's right? How do we know that what we're seeing is a real thing or close enough to a real thing to be functional? Reason. Yeah, but when reason breaks down and then, and then the understanding breaks down and then aesthetic judgment breaks down. Well, aesthetic judgment never breaks down because it's just like, oh, it's kooky. But the, uh, with, uh, uh, for this to work, actually, so without, because in philosophy, your, your, your philosophy breaks down at the exact point that you invoke God then you're not doing philosophy anymore, you're doing theology. So the game in philosophy is to put God off as long as possible. So, uh, so, so Descartes had to, uh, had to say that, that uh, he had to bring God into his system to say that he's not getting deceived because God is good and God would not deceive me. Right? So, uh, but Kant pushes it off because he's like, well, we can't be dogmatic about it. So what Kant does is uh, he, he, he bases the whole, this is called the schema, on a, um, on a moment. And the moment that he uses is uh, he's out there, and you guys have heard of the sublime, right? So, like, uh, or anyway, so he's on, the, he's, he's on a mountain encountering the great vastness of nature, and a huge, powerful storm that's just huge comes rumbling down. And the winds are just tearing, and you really see the power of, you know, like God or whatever, right? And um, so in, the, in, in sort of the English version of the sublime, that means that you, you, you're in awe at the power of God and you find out that you're really just a little human and you need to just you know, bow down. Now, uh, Kant <laughs> says, no. So he's watching this storm from a, uh, from a hurricane bunker. And he's like, what this shows is the power of my imagination. Because for me to be able to, to intuit the amount of power of this going on means that my imagination is actually bigger than reality. <laughs> and that if I have to decide between you know, empirical reality and my imagination of it, my imagination is more reliable because I can imagine more than, I can imagine a worse storm than this. So I'm more powerful than it. You like that? Isn't that a variable we just solve some of that? I think, I don't know why anybody can take Kant seriously, but that's just, you know, anyway. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, uh, and, and this is, uh, um, So this means that, uh, and, and he eventually decides that this doesn't even really exist. All that really exists is this. Your perception. Means? Yeah, because it's 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 unperceivable, so unknowable. Therefore, the thing in itself is actually just a reaction formation of your mind, because you have to attribute a, a cause to the effect. But it's a it's a fallacious interpretation. So um, so we're kind of screwed. And so we get to so we get to so naive realism we have to throw out, right? Because uh, um, for all the reasons that you all know that what you see is not real, right? So we know we're just all sort of quantum clouds, and there's just like different intensities and places, and, and, and really it's just all this kind of like, you know, subatomic particles bouncing off each other in mostly empty space, right? But uh, so we can't be this called naive realism. And plus, we've all hallucinated. We, we've gone through all of the biases about how, how like, um, how I think Hermione was hitting on me and stuff, right? But uh, this, is called, this is called transcendental philosophy. This is, so this is the, uh, when, when Cavell was talking about transcendental. So this is, this is, uh, uh, this is the transcendental schema. This other representation. That means you're a transcendental philosopher if you believe in this. But we've, uh, um, we've decided if you're comfortable with magical thinking, then transcendentalism is good. But this is the problem that Leontes makes clear in the speech that we just looked at. So this is a it's a it's a it's a crisis of the, uh, of grounding the transcendental philosophy because he's crazy, right? So his he's making his imagination following the Kantian gesture. He's making his imagination bigger than reality, and then watching it. And and and, and so this is sort of a uh, so this is why philosophers get all excited about Winter's Tale, right? Because Leontes is critiquing Kant, which is fun. Hmm. So, um, 
So the thing in itself is not directly knowable. We know that. I mean, even even um, the uh, you know the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics. This was when Einstein and Heisenberg and Bohr were all meeting together. They decided that what they were studying is not really physics. It's just what we what our, our uh, it's it's, it's uh, the quantum physics is really an intense discussion of our measuring devices. But you but you can't really know what physics is doing. It's too damn weird. And uh, um, yeah, so uh, actually this is kind of important that they've only uh, have scientific evidence of reality existing outside of human perception about three years ago was the first test that they did that showed that, uh, um, that there were actually subatomic particles when no one was looking at them. Seriously, three years ago. Now, and, and that's good news, right? But what's really weird is like things like space, time, and number don't exist if nobody's looking at them. So there's no such thing as number. That's just something we impose on the world. But there is something there regardless. That'll be my, uh, my next course, Quantum <laughs> Physics and Shakespeare. <laughs> so, uh, but the, uh, the bigger problem that Leontes brings up is that, uh, um, that, the, uh, that this is just as unreliable as that, right? So we don't know the thing in itself, but we don't know the, 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 co the, the uh, cogito any better either. So this is the problem. This is like what we've been talking about with behavioral economics and Freud and everything about how we don't know about our drives and our perceptions and we're always fooling ourselves. So how do you know anything if you can't see what's going on out there and you're batshit insane? Winter's tale, right? <laughs> so, um, eh, eh. Okay. Um, so it's not just a matter of letting fantasy go in favor of reality or better judgment or reason. You can't count on any of them. And all of them, uh, fantasy is actually probably the least reliable, or the most reliable, right? So that's weird. But fantasy is actually probably your most reliable indication. Do you, do you agree with this? Do you think that you can? Yeah, neither do, neither do I. But the, uh, um, <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, uh, but according, according, according to this, if you can't know the thing in itself, so the thing in itself in, in Winter's Tale, what's the thing in itself? The unknowable thing in itself. Hermione. Yeah, Hermione's intention, right? So, uh, and you just can't know, so you can fantasize about it, and that's what's, that's what's going to, uh, that's what's going to um, be your, you know, for all intents and purposes, you know, the reality of it. But, uh, so then we, we, we get the colostomy principle again, it's a big time, because any general unknowability makes the world and all this in it contingent, as, as, as Leontes puts it, contingent and unpredictable, and you can't count on anything just from that one, that one spot of Leontes and or, uh, Hermione's unknowable desire, the whole world falls apart as Leontes goes back to again and again and again. So uh, the lure of tragic certainty, determinism, homeostasis, death, as we have seen, this is why tragic heroes produce tragedies and force those colostomies beyond the possibility of reversal. But, uh, okay, we'll, we'll end on a joke before we go to the, uh, <laughs> because this is really funny. Uh, we've already gone through it, but I can't, I can't go. So, so uh, Leontes is giving this spiel, essentially, to uh, Camillo, who's looking at me, and looking at Leontes the same way that you guys are looking at me. And Leontes says, Make that thy question and go rot. Doest think I am so muddy, so unsettled, to appoint myself in this vexation? Solely the purity and whiteness of my sheets, which to preserve is sleep, which being spotted is goads, thorns, nettles, tails of wasps, give scandal to the blood of the prince, my son, who I do think is mine and love is mine, without right moving to it. Would I do this? Could man be so blench? So what is he saying? Do you think I would do all this to myself and ruin my reputation and ruin the reputation of my wife? Do you think anybody could possibly be this stupid? And, and what does Camillo say? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny because he's, he's crazy, just like you guys think about me. Okay, so, um, so we will, and I know you'll be chomping at the bit to get here Wednesday to find out the exciting conclusion of how do we know reality according to Shakespeare. But uh, I think I've got some quizzes to give back to you. In fact, I don't just think it. I know it. I'm certain. In fantasy and the thing in itself. Or the quizzes.